even the Lord who is on our side. Those are the two big things that this chapter is talking about. What about key words? What are some key words that would appear in this chapter? Those words that would sum it up. Blessed. Anything else? I mean, we've gone from the key phrase, the key phrase should probably have it, one of the key words, like was said, our help. So what about help? He is God is our help. So we're looking to God for help, or we're praising God for help in this passage. Anything else? Who's the main component here? Who's one of the main people being discussed in this chapter? David. <clears throat> Not necessarily David. Uh, actually, I don't think this is a Davidic song. It says here, someone who reads that David. Okay, so then this would be one of the ones that David wrote. But I would go with Lord, because that's who we're crying out to. God is the one who's going to help us. He's the one that's going to deliver us. And then finally, side, I have down, which would be, he's on our side, or God is with us. So that's the what I would say is the key phrases, key words, and key verses, or the key verse. As we look at this chapter, and we study it in a little bit more detail, doing a quick look throughout the New Testament, it does not appear that Psalm 124 was quoted anywhere else in the New Testament. The poetic style would be that of a staircase parallelism, whereas the second part of the verse develops the thought of the first, without quoting the exact same words. There really is no known history on Psalm 124, other than the fact that we know that it is a song of degree, which means that it's one of those songs that would have been sung while they were traveling to the temple itself, or to Jerusalem during the time of the feast. And we would try to find Jesus Christ within Psalm 124. We, according to Keith L. Brooks, he said that Christ is seen. Why were we chosen in Christ when others were overwhelmed by sin and carried down is a question that comes to many questions of uh, Christians. And he takes that from Romans chapter 9 and verse 18. If someone would please read Romans 9 to 18. Romans 9, 18. So when we look at the division of the psalm, is there any real division within Psalm 124 itself? Some may seem to be written at one particular time in history and another another time. From what I can tell, there appears nothing of that nature. However, when we're reading verses 1 and verse 2, there does appear to be a division. Verse 1 reads, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say. And then we have the repetition of, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, and then it goes on with the pre other verses. <coughs> when we look at this passage, the redundancy points out something that is not uncommon in Hebrew song. And does anybody know what that is? We've mentioned it time and time and time again. What is one of the styles that they have when it comes to their songs and people singing? We'll talk about that a little bit later, but no, that, 
That deals with us with study and not the one with singing. When we look at the history of the Hebrew people, when it comes to their songs, there was a lot of responsory action. What do I mean by that? There would be one group or one person saying one verse, and another group or another person responding to it, kind of like a question and answer type thing. We've seen that back in previous psalms. My mind always goes back to the psalm where they were discussing the Ark of the Covenant, where you have the group of people on the outside of the gate and the other group on the inside going back and forth with question and answer. This is a little bit more subtle, but we have the redundancy in verse 2, and we have the end phrase of verse 1, which states, uh, now may Israel say. And with that, now may Israel say, we have the repetition, repetition we have the repetition, or a kind of a repeating of verse of the previous phrase, and because of that, we get the idea that there was some type of responsory action. There were two groups, two singers at least, in this case, that would sing Psalm 124. Now, while you already started on the Lord on in all caps. So what does that tell us about when we see the Lord in all caps in the KJV? It means Jehovah. It means all. It means anything that you need, God is. And also notice while we're in verse 1, notice after the word it, those two, uh, those three words had not been, there's something special about those words had not been as well. What's going on there? What's the type font? Or are they made mention of in some way? Are they brought out? Are they brought to our attention? They are. They're italicized. Can anyone tell me what it means when words are italicized in the KJV? When the words are italicized in the KJV, it means that they were not originally there. But rather, they are placed there by the translators to give us clarification to this verse. Otherwise, it would have read, If the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say. So they threw in those three words, had not been for a little bit better understanding, a little bit more clarification. And we make a transition in Psalm 124, uh, verses 123. We talked about Psalm 120, 121, 2, and 23 last week, more specifically 21, 22, and 23, whereas we see rejoicing or declarations in the previous Psalms. I will look into the hills where the coming of my help, my help cometh from the Lord. I cried unto the Lord in my distress, and he delivered me. Unto thee lift I up my eyes, O Lord. But in the previous Psalms, we get a declaration. And then in Psalm 123, we get the cry, the plea, God, we need you to move on our behalf. And then we get to Psalm 24, where once again we have a declaration or a rejoicing that we know who God is. And we're glad that he is on our side. And that we can thank him for who he is and all the times that he delivered us. It is not a woe is me passage, but it is a declaration and a praise and a worship for God and what he has done in our life. As we go down through in verse 3, Then they had swallowed up us quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Who swallowed us up? The enemy. The enemy came upon us and he swallowed us up quick. You know, if we're not careful, we do have an enemy that can swallow us up quick. And he's looking and watching for us just to make that one misstep that he can move on. And he's ready to pounce. Pounce. The Bible states that he is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And it's not just the devil himself, and it's not just his minions. But when we look at the world around us, yes, the devil can attack our mind. He can bring illness, 
illness upon us, if God allows him to, but if he wants to work in our surroundings, there's something that he has to do. He needs a body to work. And when we look back at the previous passages of the Psalms of Degree, is are the authors crying when the enemy comes in about the devil or his minions? Or are they saying, woe is me, the devil's after me today. He's on me hard today. No, so far there's been no mention of the devil. There's been no mention of his minions. But there are mentions of the wicked with their lying and deceitful lips that are constantly trying to come against him. Now, if the devil wants to work in this church, he, if he cannot get the pastor, what's he going to do? He's not going to be able to just walk through the back doors, present himself and say, I'm the devil and I'm here to work. But he's going to have to use somebody. And the only way he's going to be able to use somebody is if they allow him to. And here in Psalm 124, that is what he's talking about. Those that come against him, the wicked, they shall swallow him up quick the with their wrath, and swallow them up quick when the wrath was kindled against him. I'm sure we've all had people in our life that for some reason or another, and we didn't even have to do anything to them, but they came against us, and they came against us full force. And when people come against us, it causes drama, it causes trials, it causes tribulations. Things that not necessarily are our fault, but it does bring grief to our life. And it's the devil at times working through them to bring us down. Sometimes it may be of their own volition, it might be of their own deceitfulness and their own wickedness. But there are times when the devil will use it to bring down the Christian that his will may be able to work that he may be able to get a foothold in the church, whatever it may be, he will use somebody and they will come in quick. And sometimes we don't even see it coming. I'm sure there have been times in our own lives possibly that we've had those that were supposed to be our friends or that they were close to us and they turn around and stab us in the back. Or they start spreading rot, lies or rumors. You know, if it would have been somebody we knew that was out to get us in the first place, or somebody that uh, we might not have been close, up, close to, it might not have been so bad, but what made it so bad was it was somebody that was close to us. And because of that, they could have hurt us to a greater degree. And they came quickly upon us. And for some reason, their wrath was kindled against us. And then... This wrath gets likened to water. In verse 4, Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. The waters have overwhelmed us. They brought us to the point that maybe we didn't know what to do. We were emotionally a, a wreck. Um, maybe we would cry at the nighttime when nobody was watching. Um, maybe we would find ourselves on our face before God, not knowing what to do. We would be so overwhelmed, perhaps we were losing sleep at night. When the enemy comes in, he comes in quickly, and he will do everything he can to discourage us. And the Bible also likens the enemy of our soul to water. What does the Bible say concerning the enemy, concerning the devil? When it comes to likening to him to water, when the enemy comes in like a like a flood, it's not a small trickle, it's not just a little bit, but he comes in all at once. He comes in quickly and he overwhelms us. And they try to overtake us, whether the enemy is somebody mortal or immortal. When they are out to get us, they are doing everything they get, can to take us down, and they will do it quickly, all at once. It will seem as if it came out of nowhere. And it will overwhelm us. And it will plague us. And it seems like the stream had gone over our soul. 
like we're being drowned. There's no place to go. We're stuck. We're caught in the water. We're stuck in the flow. And there is no way to get out. And when there's no way to get out, there's only one thing for us to do. And that is to cry on God. Cry to God. And when we look at Psalm 124, we're looking at these verses in detail. And because of that, it may seem like this person's crying out for help, but he's not crying out for help. He is rejoicing. He is praising God. He's saying that all these times that these things have occurred, when the enemy came in, he tried to take me quickly. But you know what? God was on my side. When I felt like I was overwhelmed and I could not get any sleep, the peace of God would come in. And because God was on my side, I could get rest. When it seemed like my soul was stuck in the flow and the waters come past me, I was caught in the undertow and could not go anywhere. I could not get my head up to get a catch a breath. I was stuck. The waters come past me. But God was still on my side. No matter what the enemy wanted to do to me, no matter how badly he wanted to take me down, no matter how badly much I may have been paralyzed for whatever reason, whether it was spiritually, emotionally, or sometimes even physically, the stress of the things can just overcome us and place such a great weight on us. It doesn't matter because the author goes on to say, I know who's on my side. God is on my side. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, you know who's going to raise up that standard, that wall of protection? My God who is on my side. Those moments when fear has overtaken me and I feel like I cannot move. You know who's going to bring peace into my life? The God who is on my side. And the God that was on my side, he came in to deliver me. And because of all these things, he says that, goes on to say that the proud waters had gone over my soul. But despite it all, Blessed is the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. He hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. You know, it may have felt like the, we were going to give up. It may have felt like a hopeless situation. And it may have felt like we were inches from death or inches from giving up or we were just almost done with everything. I hear I got a right from the outside. I got an amen corner. But he says, I may have gotten that close, but you know what? God was on my side. You know, I didn't need anybody else in this world to come to my aid. And maybe there was nobody else. And we've all probably been in those situations where it seems like there is no escape. I don't know which way to go. I don't know which side is up. I don't know which way is down. But there's one thing that we can always say like this often. We can rejoice because of the Lord that was on our side. We talk about people praying through at the altar, and that's becoming less and less of a term anymore. Praying is becoming less and less of an activity, it seems, in the church world anymore. But when do we discover true deliverance over a situation? Is it in those moments when we're crying out to God for help? Is it in the moment when we're flat on our face saying, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. God, so-and-so is doing this. So-and-so is being a bully. Is that when we find deliverance? Is that when we experience the peace? Typically, no. Typically, it comes when we find ourselves in a place where we're praising God. That's when the peace comes. That's when the deliverance comes. That's when we experience Jesus Christ as the Prince of Peace in our situation. He may come by in those situations and give us rest assurance that he is there with us. But when do we really get the breakthrough? 
It's not when we're begging and pleading for help, but rather it's when we've given God the situation, when we place it in his hands and said, okay, God, no matter what, I'm going to praise you. In the words of casting crowns, I'm going to praise you in the storm. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm experiencing, I know you have everything under control. I recognize you as the Prince of Peace, and I know that you will not allow the situation to overtake me. Lord, it is in your hands. Do with it what you will. Because we, when we do that, we may not get the answer we want, but we'll get a release. We'll get the comfort. We'll get the peace. Sometimes, God does make us go through the trial. Sometimes, God does make us go through the fiery furnace. With the three Hebrew children, God didn't ever deliver them from their situation. He came in, and he was there, but they still got cast in the fiery furnace. They may not have gotten burned up, they came out victorious, but none of us would have wanted to wait until we were in the fiery furnace to experience God. We would have said, God, move here. God, seal it up. Knock it over. Whatever you have to do, put out the fire. But sometimes God makes us go through the fire. But that does not mean he's not there with us every step of the way. And while things may get tough, they may get hard, in the battle of it all, in the middle of all, he is right there with us every step of the way. We may have gone close to the teeth of the enemy. We may have gotten close to that mouth of the lion that walks around seeking whom he may devour. But he was never able to touch us. Now, as long as we place all our faith and our trust in God, God will deliver us every single time. And because of that, we need to praise him in every situation. He goes on to say in verse 7, Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of a fowler, of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we are escaped. This snare that he's talking about is basically a net sandwich. Basically, there's a net on the ground, you get stuck in it, and it flips over, and it traps you to the ground, pins you to the ground, and you're stuck there in the net. You are sandwiched by the net on both sides. The thing with this type of trap is, if you're stuck facing upward, you can see the enemy coming. There is no fear like you've been put in a sack and you can't see anything, but your eyes are wide open. Your ears are wide open. And sometimes the enemy is not the only one that wants to have a shot at you. And when you're stuck in that trap, you might be waiting for the lion to come and get you out, the devil. But there are other predators out there that may come and scratch and paw at you and place other uh, marks on you and hurt you even farther or may try to take a bite out of you. If they don't, you can see, you can hear the enemy approaching, you can hear him coming to get you. But the Bible says that God, who was on our side, has broken the snare. He has broken the trap, and he has set us free. You know, sometimes we do make mistakes. Sometimes we do mess up. Sometimes we do allow a slight opening for the devil to get in, and he does sneak his foot in. But if we would turn to God, place all trust in him, and leave it in his situation, he does not allow mean for things to do us harm, but rather they are done for a reason. They are done to draw us closer to him. They are done to, for us to develop our relationship with him and rely and to farther rely upon him more fully than we have in the past. Because there is only one person in this entire universe that can deliver us from the snare of the enemy. There is only one person who can deliver us from any financial problems, any emotional problems, any physical problems, any health issues. And in the end, 
there's only one person in this entire universe that can deliver our soul that was born in sin and keep it from going to hell. And that is God. He is the one that will deliver us in every situation. And because of that, the author rejoices. Doesn't matter what the enemy tries to do to him, he knows where his help is. He's been living right, and he knows who's on his side. God is on his side. He knows that other things may arise in life. People may come against him. Ministers may come against him. His own family may come against him. But no matter what traps were set for him in his life, whether he got into them or whether somebody else placed him and um, got him into them, because let's face it, not everything that happens in life that is bad to us is because of something we did. Sometimes other people do stupid things, and as a result, we have to go through certain hard times and certain trials. But regardless of what it would be, we can always say, our help is in the name of the Lord. And as we've seen so many times, especially in the Psalms, Lord is all caps, which means he's Jehovah. It doesn't matter what your trial is. It doesn't matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter what you need from God. He is going to be that in that situation. And let's face it, sometimes we don't need God just to be the Lord our banner, to raise up, uh, let everybody know who's on our side. And not only, always do we need him to be uh, God, the God of peace. We need him to be other things as well. And when we look at it as God Jehovah, it doesn't matter what you need for that situation. That is exactly what he's going to be throughout the entire thing. And regardless of what comes our way, regardless of what trials, temptations we have to face, regardless of how many fiery furnaces we have to go through, our hope is in God. Our hope comes from God. And because of that, we can rejoice. As we've already said, our deliverance, our peace, they don't come when we're begging and pleading God. But nine times out of ten, our peace, our comfort, whatever we need, comes in those moments of rejoicing. So may we never forget that our hope comes from God. And if it doesn't get even more specific, may we rejoice in verse 8. He goes, my hope comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our hope is not just a feeble hope, but rather our hope comes from the Lord. And our Lord doesn't just exist. And he just not wasn't always there, but the Bible says the Lord that created heaven and earth. What do we know about heaven and earth? Well, one preacher put it this way. He is the only one that could reach out into nothing, grab nothing, and hang it on something. He created everything we saw, see out of nothing. How much more is he able to help us in every situation? He is not just the creator of all things, but he created it at his own volition. At the mere voice, at his mere words, he created something out of nothing. He reached down drew something in the dust and breathed life and that life is man. Our God is holy. He is worthy. And if he can create heaven and earth out of nothing, how much more can we truly recognize him as Lord Jehovah all in all? He is everything that we need. He is more than able to deliver us from those around us, from the wicked, from lying, deceitful lips, and from the devil and his minions of sons. Our Lord is all in all, and because of that, we need to rejoice and praise him in every single situation.
Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point in time? If not, we'll bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be good soil for your words to fall on, that we may remember it throughout the great day, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our life, to our hearts, that we would be even farther transformed into your very image, that we would remember it throughout the week, even greater than that, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leaders and the musicians, give them a special blessing as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Anoint the song leaders as they sing praise you and the songs, Lord, and give them a special blessing. Knowing the pastor's mind is, looks like he would bring forth the words you have us to hear. And we ask, we give him a special blessing as well. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.